<laughs> We've invited Blondin's grandson here. He will actually be setting up across the interstate. He's, in, um, he's going to wait till after the service to see. Come on, how many have your Bibles today? Turn them on, hold them up, whatever you're reading from. Would you say this with me? I am what his word says I am. I can do what his word says I can do. I can be. What his word says I can be. So right now, I will hear his word, I receive his word, and I'll obey his word because I love his word. Can you give it up for our online campus and for Madison and Fayetteville, for Smith Lake, Shoals? Come on, give it up. We love you today. And I know you had powerful Easter services last week. And uh, as our campus pastors, as every one, one of them preached and ministered in the worship, God just met us in, a, in an amazing way. And can I tell you, even yesterday, thank you for all of our leaders who served. We had the honor of hosting uh, a memorial service yesterday. And can I tell you, when I gave the altar call at the end, between at minimum conservatively 50 to 60 people gave their life to Christ at a funeral. And I thank God that he allows us to extend our arms and to be an expression of his love and his grace and his mercy and to be able to love our city. How many realize he loves our city? But our city is not defined by numbers, it's defined by people. And God brought us to the kingdom for such a time as this. And I'm so grateful that we get to do life together. And even the Sunday after Easter, look at your neighbor and say, you look great for the Sunday after Easter. You, have to sh you actually showed up. <laughs> People get wore out, man. They, they, like, I, you know, but you, you're here, and I'm thankful you're here today. I'm thankful you're here last week. I, you know, I'm just thankful people show up. I realized I can't be, make people come. I could probably run some people off. I've, I've done that. didn't mean to. You know, it's just that they didn't like the color socks I had. But anyway, it was, it was all about that. But we are so honored that you're here today. Thank you. I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. 
I want to do kind of a follow-up from last week. I want to talk to you about a growing faith, not a designer faith. We actually live in a day when so many people want to design their own faith. They want to design their own walk. I called it a couple of weeks ago. It's a builder bear Jesus mentality. That I want to build a Jesus the way I want him to be. I, I, want, I want him to care for what I care for. I want to kind of align my life so it's a designer faith. No, God doesn't give us a designer faith. He gives us a developed faith. He develops us. He, he grows us. He gets us ready for things, man. It's like, it's like the man who was, he went up here to get his license renewed. How many know that can just be an experience right there? If you show up at the wrong time, I've been there where I've waited an hour and a half. You know, and you're in that line, and this guy was, it was one of those days. And so, man, he waited an hour and a half, finally got up. He was frustrated. He had he missed a meeting. He was just aggravated, man. So he, he walks up, and they, he got everything done. Then they took his picture again, and when he looked at his license, he's like, wow, that was rough. He said, you think, he said, I was frustrated here. Do you think I need to take another picture for this? She said, nah, it works. That's how you're going to look when you get pulled over anyway, so don't worry about it. <laughs> he like My wife actually laughed. <laughs> I'm blown away. I just, wow, it's, it's a miraculous day. In Ephesians chapter 4, I'm going to begin with verse 11, and, and I'm, I don't want to... I don't have time to tie in the first 10 verses, but it's all about how he gave us gifts to equip us. But here is the portion in verse 11. Until he's going to give us these gifts to develop us, even the fivefold ministry, everything about our life, God has provided what we need to grow. To not stay where we are. Look at your neighbor and say, would you grow up? I'm 54. I still hear that from my wife. Would you grow up? He said, I'm going to give you all of this until. I love the untils. But it's that until that really messes with you. We all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, not manured, but matured, attaining to the whole measure, wow, of the fullness of Christ. We need to, in other words, we got to cooperate with the other members. Let me just give you this. We, we got to have some cooperation. We need each other. You may not know the one sitting next to you, but God has actually could have brought them in your life to help develop your faith. <laughs> it's not always anyway. We got to cooperate with the members of the body of Christ to experience the fullness of Christ and a greater maturity in our faith. But watch this. Do not try to mature in isolation or as a member of the body is what it's saying, but your faith development will be incomplete. So speaking the truth in love, let us grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. And I ask you in these next few moments that would you allow me to write your heart to your people today here and online and all of our amazing campuses today. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, even as we grow in the faith, one of the statements of faith in the sacraments that we've been given, the sacraments basically two, communion and baptism. I said a couple of weeks ago, communion becomes an illustration of what he has done for us, his body, his blood. Baptism represents what he has done in us. We have died to the old man. We are resurrected into the new. Old things pass away. Behold, all things become new. It becomes a statement of righteousness. We're not saved by baptism. I, I remember hearing my father say when I was growing up, he said, you can be baptized in every pond, pool, every little mud hole between here and Canada and know every tadpole by name, and it will not save you. 
But what baptism does is it's a public proclamation that says, here's what he's done in my life. I no longer belong to myself. I have died to Rusty, and I've been resurrected a new man in Christ. And so next Sunday, as we gather, if God has even done a new work in your life, there have been a couple of times I, I've, he, he has, he's brought me into a new level, new area in my life. I don't like really the term level because we, we, when we think of the term level, we think we're above someone else. No, he brings us into a new dynamic of knowing him. I mean, there have been times I just wanted to make a, make a public profession of that. So it's a celebration. So next Sunday, we're going to celebrate it. And, and all of our campus is coming together. And I encourage you to be a part of that. But there are, but faith, faith comes from the Greek word, which means this. It's a firm conviction producing a full knowledge of God's revelation of truth. It actually has to do with a personal surrender. It's to conduct, it's a con, do it, it's a conduct inspired by what we surrender, faith. It's a confident persuasion that God will do what he says he will do. And it goes a bit farther than just believing it, now it's acting on. As Blondin was giving that pitch and he's saying, hey, if you believe I'm the greatest and I can do this, get into the wheelbarrow. What Jesus did when he died and rose again, he said, come on in, the water's fine. I want you to know that I, as I live, you will live also. It says in Hebrews that faith is the evidence of things not seen, the assurance of things that are hoped for. What does growing in our faith look like? Actually, there are different, I believe there are different kinds of faith. One of the kind of faith is, I call it a fathered faith. A fathered faith. It's like, Adam, can you join me? Being a son. And I, I, I don't see it. I know all of our kids' questions are going, Scott, come and join me. I need, I need two of these. I love the passage In 1 John, and it says, I'm writing to you, little children. You're going to be the little child because I remember you as one. <laughs> You're grown. I'm a grown man. You're a grown man now. You have a child. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to call Pastor Scott. He's, he's going to be the young man. So a child still in my eyes. He's Okay, I'm embarrassing him now. I'm sorry. But it says, I'm writing to you little children in 1 John. Why? Because your sins are forgiven and you know the Father. When you read that passage, it's two different times. He's saying, I'm writing to you children. I'm writing to you fathers and I'm writing to you young men. He's writing and encouraging children to say, listen, you, you're innocent. Your sins are forgiven. You, you know you're forgiven. There's a lot of growing that's going to get you from here to here to here. Your faith is going to develop, but you've got to understand as a child, the innocent knowing, it's not childishness, it's childlike that your sins are forgiven and you know the Father. He said, I write to you fathers because you're stable, because you know him who is from the beginning. Because you know him who is from the beginning, you're unmovable. There is a wisdom that is there. But he says, but I write to you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. You're strong. The word of God dwells inside of you. You've overcome the wicked one. It says it twice. So now you've got innocent, you've got stable, and you've got zeal. How many realize when our faith is being developed, if we are not having a fathered faith in our life, someone who encourages us. See, we have many teachers but few fathers. Teachers tell you how to do it. Fathers show you how to do it. And if all you have is zeal without wisdom, and you're just fighting a fight, you can get yourself in a fight God never intended you to be in. Because you just live your life out of zeal, picking fights now. But a father, why did he write to children, to fathers, and to the young? 
because he puts a father right in the center that says, I want to show you how to grow to be a young man. I want to take that it's not just about you being forgiven for sin. It is about you growing into a young man that knows how to take on hell with a water pistol and that your faith stands strong because that is a fathered faith. We need fathers and mothers. Thank you. Thank you. I changed your diaper, but I won't do it again. Look at the father of faith, Abraham. I'm in trouble. Sorry. It says in Romans chapter 4. Are y'all getting anything out of this today? Watch this. Romans 4. It says against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was good as dead, yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding God's promise, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do everything that he had promised. In a hopeless situation, Abraham had hope. He faced the facts, but didn't let the facts shake him. I mean, realize you're in denial if you don't face the facts. Well, I just don't confess it. It just ain't happening. No, why don't you just confess what is happening and face the facts, but don't let the facts shake you. They don't define you. God's word, his promise, faith is being developed in us in the most critical moments of our life. He was strengthened. He strengthened his faith. He gave glory to God. He just kept praising him through it. And he was fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he promised. You remember the three Hebrew children? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They are thrown, they're, they're going to be thrown into the fiery furnace because they would not bow to the idol. And here's what they said. Our God is able to deliver us. But if he doesn't, we still ain't bowing. Because my faith is not about if he does what I feel like he needs to do for me right now. No, he is enough for me. So even if he doesn't, I still am not bowing because I've got a fathered faith. Daniel had fathered those young men to believe God no matter what it cost them. There's also another kind of faith that I've found is a frustrated faith. <laughs> a frustrated faith. It says in James, for as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so faith apart from works is dead. You know, a frustrated faith typically comes from a faith that is unfed. Unfed. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. In, in, in the Greek, it's actually a continuum. Faith grows by hearing and by hearing and by hearing. But it, the, the word is not just something we use for our devotions. It is our devotion to the word that starts shaping who we are and develops our faith, strengthens our faith. But we get frustrated in faith when we don't feed our faith. So a faith that is unfed is frustrating. A faith that is uneasy, always anxious. I love what Philippians 4 says, don't worry about it. Be anxious for nothing. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Thank him for all that he's done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. But faith is frustrating when it's uneasy. It's always full of an anxious heart. An anxious heart is a frustrated life. If fear is dominating you, fear will always try to come to freeze you into defeat. Fear is trying to keep you from moving forward. Fear keeps you out of the bucket. Right. Even though you, they saw a man go back and forth, back and forth, doing everything, but no one trusted him enough to get into the bucket. What happens, though, when God calls us? And it is, for by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. However, when a faith gets frustrated, it's because it's not feeding itself on what God grows it with and gets uneasy and anxious. There's also a third thing. Faith 
that is unused. Faith works, <laughs> but it has to be worked. Now listen, this is basic 101 today. Because sometimes we need to remember, we don't want to get so deep that we drown. Yet we don't want to be so shallow we don't understand. I know a lot of people that you, they spend their life, and it breaks my heart, they spend their life just playing in the shallow end. Well, bro, there, there's water to swim in. That God wants to take you deeper in the knowledge of who he is so that no matter what tries to overrun you, there is a faith that keeps you whether you get out of it or not. There is a faith that sustains you because he's developing. It's not a designer faith to make you look good, to dress the part, to look the part, to have the Christian ease, have all the right statements to make but no substance to produce anything. He wants to develop a faith in us. I love it what Adam Clark said, the more a man exercises faith in Christ, the more he is enabled to believe. The more he believes, the more he receives. And the more he receives, the more able he is to work for God. Obedience is his delight because love to God and man is the element in which his soul lives. I like that. But there's a frustrated faith. I see a third faith, and I call it the growing faith. Growing faith. In Romans 5, it says, therefore, being justified by faith. That's a, that's a, that's a great biblical word that... I brought it up a few weeks ago. That means just as if you'd never sinned. You know, we tend to look on the outward appearance. God says man looks on the outward appearance. I look on the, man, on the heart. I know the motive. I know the intention. I know what's going on really inside. We tend to judge people by what we see on the outward appearance. We are so prone in humanity to buy the apps that fix our look. And we try to get the Bible to app our way into defining and designing us in such a way that we just, we just look, we have the look. But what happens with that is we tend to look at people who don't look like that and judge them because they don't look like us. Or maybe they're not on the same plane as we are or the same level. <laughs> or maybe they don't have the same... They, they've not had the same years of encountering God and knowing him. I have never caught a fish that I cleaned it before I caught it. Never. I've never, I've never gone fishing, man, where I, I got down. I, I used to dive, and I, I used to love to dive. And there was no way you can go down and clean something underneath, then get up, throw a line down, and catch it. You've already killed before you ever catch. How many times do we kill off the ones Jesus has called us to reach out to because they didn't look like, act like, they didn't have that religious... And because they offended us. The world will, don't get offended by the world. You don't find in the epistles where it's the world that the kingdom is bringing in alignment. The epistles is about trying to get the church just to live right. Paul never went to the Roman world preaching anything but Christ and him crucified. He said, it's the foolishness of preaching. Anyone is even saved. He said, I'm not trying to get them to act like me. Oh, I want them to know Jesus. The moment you know him, he will come and change you from the inside out. Your fruit may not look like it in the beginning, but when the root is severed, it will start taking care. Anybody with me today? Come on, all of our campuses, hear me. It's time to live this thing. He didn't call us to hide in some building. If this is all it is, I quit. I just quit, man. I don't want this. I, I want souls. I want, I, want, I want the hurting. I want the broken. I want the elite. I want the wealthy who can't find it to fix anything inside of them. I want the ones who are just waiting to find him. 
I'm off my notes, sorry. It says, therefore, being justified by faith, I got to hurry. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And not only so, but we rejoice in tribulation. How do you do that? I don't know. Knowing that the tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance, character, character, hope. Hope does not disappoint because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Do you know the word justified? It was actually the bullet of the Reformation. Because they had, the church had brought in what the church, religion always does. Religion always brings in all of these designer faith things. It says, you got to do this, you got to do that. You got to look this way. You got to do this liturgy. You got to walk over. I'm not against liturgy. I'll be honest, I wore a tie for two weeks in a row, and I just, I don't want any expectations. So I just came in a t shirt today. I'm like, I, I ain't doing that. Just thought I'd throw that in there. I may be in Bermuda's next week. I don't know. <laughs> No, she won't let me. But anyway, <laughs> she said, have you seen your legs? And I went, yeah, I know. I know. My nickname was Chicken Legs for a reason in high school. I can't believe I just told you that. <laughs> but it came, it says the just shall live by faith. It's through that justification by faith that we have peace with God. What that scripture is saying, one translation says, let us keep on having in the sense of enjoying peace with God. Faith causes you to enjoy peace. That we're not responsible for having peace in the sense of making it, but in the sense of enjoying it. I love what Billy Graham said. He said, if we have peace with God and the peace of God, we will become peacemakers. Can I say that again? If we have peace with God and the peace of God, we will become peacemakers. And they are called, Jesus said, sons of God. That, you, that I can enjoy peace. Enjoyment goes, it's not a hilarious thing. It's actually a very involved settling thing. That the peace... Paul would say, actually goes beyond what your mind can understand or comprehend. Peace. Shalom in the old. Remember? Nothing missing, nothing broken. And it says we rejoice. We have peace with God and we can rejoice. By faith in Christ stand in the, his, in the sphere of his grace, I can rejoice. I can enjoy peace. I can keep on rejoicing. And that kind of peace walks me into tribulation. I don't like that word. But Jesus said, in this world, you will have persecution. You will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. He, he, he kind of set us up. He said, it's coming. But be of good cheer. Okay. I mean, that's not real exciting. Your faith is going to be tried, but be of good cheer. You can rejoice. See, peace with God, out of that peace produces a place of rest. We start growing out of that. The place of rest for us as believers is really the place of death, where we're dying to what we want, trusting him for what he does. It's a place where we stop striving and we start living. It's a place of being born again into a new and living way. A few years ago, I read a story of the Egyptian believers and it kind of combined with the China believers. If you've been watching what's happening in China right now, the persecution, and this new ruler has said he wants to stamp out Christianity in China. And he is arresting. He is, they're blowing up churches. His whole philosophy is one Christian is one less Chinese. The church has been moved underground again. 
like never before. When you watch the church in Egypt or in a Muslim country, people think nothing's happening. There's no, can, can I tell you, God is not bound by barriers. The church has always thrived in persecution and tribulation. Faith has always exploded. It's what launched the church out of Jerusalem to get to Samaria, Judea, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. But Egyptian believers a few years ago and Chinese believers were asked, please, they asked the American church, please don't pray for our persecution to end because it strengthens our faith and spreads the gospel. But we are praying for the American church that when persecution and tribulation comes, that your faith doesn't fail. All because of the shallowness and pursuits we find ourselves in to try to design our own faith. He warned Peter. He said, hey, Simon, Satan desires to sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith doesn't fail. I prayed for you, Pete. The di if, if you know the difference, and, and it's really something I've taught through the years, there's a difference in winnowing and sifting. It was a, it was a type of getting the wheat separated from the chaff. And, and, and at harvest time, they would take, there was a winnowing process, and the winnowing process is up on a, on a hill. They would take the wheat on a windy day, windy day, and they would take the wheat and throw it up in the air, and the wind would separate the bad from the good, and the good would fall to the ground. That was winnowing. Sifting was different. Sifting would take a sifter. And they would take the wheat and put it in a big sifter and began to sift. And the sifting separated the good from the bad. And what Jesus was saying to Simon Peter is he said, Satan is desiring to sift every good thing out of your life. He is trying to destroy. He wants to take every good thing I've placed inside of you and that all that's left is a faithless man. But he said, but son, I have prayed for you that your faith does not fail. Can I tell us today, if Jesus has prayed for you, you can be assured Father answers his prayer every time if you'll just trust him. Look at your neighbor and say, grow up. There are building blocks of faith that we find in Romans 5, and I'm almost done today. Building blocks of faith. I pray you'll go home and study today. Building blocks of faith. The first building block is tribulation. It's a place of learning the voice of the Father. Tribulation has to do with trial, ordeal, difficulty, trouble, problem, hardship, mi misery. It's a place of tension. Tension is the place where muscles develop. I really wouldn't know a lot about that right now because I've not had a lot of tension lately <laughs> in a gym. My wife has hired me a trainer not hired him, she begged him. And so Nathan has been waiting on me for six months. And he's on the security team here, and every time I see him, I get convicted. I'm like, dear God, I'm... my wife, she did that to me. She doesn't want my belly button sucking up on my face when I run anymore. Are y'all awake here? Is it... I'm sorry I said that. <laughs> I did. It's just that picture right now I'm having to rebuke. I'm not responsible for what I say under the anointing, so if you <laughs> had, nothing, had nothing, to, nothing to do with the anointing. Nothing. <sighs> Hurry, rest. Do you realize Peter would say, the one who Jesus said he's trying to sift you like we, he would say in verse 5 of chapter 1 of 1 Peter, God is keeping careful watch over us in the future. The day is coming when you'll 
have it all, life healed and whole. This is the message paraphrase. I know how great this makes you feel, even though you have to put up with every kind of aggravation in the meantime, but pure gold put in the fire comes out of it proved pure. Genuine faith put through this suffering comes out proven genuine. That the whole goldsmith, the, the purpose of taking gold in its raw form, placing it in a furnace, heating it, taking the dross, getting all of the impurities out of it over and over again. The whole goal of the goldsmith is that he knows the gold is ready when he can look over and see the reflection of his face. Do you realize our Faith is more precious than gold and silver. And even the things Father filters in our life through the things that we suffer, even things that affect our life is what that word means. Father is pure, using that to purify, strengthen us until it gets to the point he sees his image in us. The second building block is persevering. Perseverance, it means stability, resolve. It's a condition of being stable. It means steadfastness, the ability to remain under difficulties without giving in. Can I say that again? The ability to remain under difficulties without giving in. He paid too much of a price for us to just give up and walk away. But tribulation, trial, produces steadfastness, which produces character. Character has to do with integrity. It's, it's actually the proof. It's the nature, quality. It's the temperament. It's a moral fiber. It's your makeup. He said, not only does it produce just the trial of your faith, produces this perseverance, this stability, but he's proving character in us, the proof in the pudding. Even for young people, hear me, man, every student, let no one look down on you because of your youthfulness, but in speech, in conduct, love, faith, purity, show yourself to be an example of the believers. There's a character he's developing in us, and character produces hope. Hope is not just expectation, it is actually confidence. It's a building block of confidence. Now, there's, there's a difference in arrogance and confidence. Some can kind of hide arrogance with what they say is confidence, but, they're, but when there's pure confidence in the Lord, it's not in your education, it's not in your strength, it's not in your talent, your gifts, it is not in your ambition. It is completely wrapped up. He is my everything. You are my strength. You are my source. God, in you I live, I move, I have my being. There is a confidence that happens that when we are challenged and we suffer, we're affected by things, it develops steadfastness. It, it deepens the quality of our character and it deepens a tested character results in a confidence. If he did it then, he going to do it again. Is anybody with me today at all of our campuses? I'm almost done. Johnny, if you would come and help me. The other building block is satisfaction. It actually means contentment. It's fulfillment. See, when our hope is centered on him and on his promises, he said it's a hope that will never be disappointed. Disappointment means put to shame. Sometimes we put our expectations as we do on people, on a spouse, even sometimes on our children. It produces disappointment. We put on them this pressure to produce. He said, well, that, that's what they need to have. That's, that's what we have to have. There has to be this tension. There's enough tension in life right now to try to tear people apart. God, God doesn't, aren't you thankful? He didn't look at you and say, if you don't measure up to this in six months, I'm, I'm, I'm letting you go. I am 49 years into serving him. Gave my life to him when I was five. And 
and I'm so glad he hasn't given up on me. There have been things in my life I thought, Rusty, you got to get over this. You, you got to quit struggling with this area. Does anybody feel like I'm? I, you got to quit thinking like that. And, I'm, I, I, and I've tried formulas and I've tried all of these things, all these systems and everything. I'm not against the system. The systems can be there for us. But man, it's not a system I need. It is his spirit that comes and says, I'm developed. I'm not, son, I don't need you designing your faith and what it should look like. No, you just come away with me and watch what I do. I will put a confidence in you that will never be disappointed and a contentment. Contentment. His love that he will pour out in our heart by his spirit. It's, it all comes that as he pours it out to us. I wish I had time to talk about the supplement of faith because there's a supplement faith. Can I just read that, what that is? It's in first, Second Peter chapter 1, verses 3. It actually calls it. I love it. It says, supplement your faith. Everybody's into supplements. Man, they'll help align your body. Do you realize there's just some things in the word that if you will start digging into it, it will start causing exponential growth in your faith. You say, what is it? Here's what he says. Add virtue. That means courage, fortitude. Add knowledge, true wisdom, by which your faith is increased. Add temperance, self-control. Add patience to it. <laughs> Never pray for patience. But if you need it, and I've never met anyone who didn't, but if you start adding patience, your faith will start building stronger. If you'll add godliness, that de deep reverential fear of the Lord, if you'll add brotherly kindness, if you'll start practicing being kind, you'll be amazed what it will do to your faith. If you will add love, love to your whole being and say, God, just the love you poured out in my heart by your spirit, would you add that in my life? And he said, do these things and you will never fall away. Then God will give you a grand entrance into eternal kingdom of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's a faith that doesn't just fail in a moment. Amen? I just believe we're to be, if we're people of faith, that means we're people who believe. And if you don't believe today, you can start today because he has placed a seed faith inside of you. It may seem so small, but there is enough faith that God has given you as a gift that you can say this, Lord, I don't know how you're going to do it, but I ask you, forgive me, come into my life, change me. And that seed faith starts growing into a tree in your life and maturing in you. And you'll find yourself one day looking back and go, wow, look how he made all things new. Look what he has done. Look what God has done. God, give us a people of faith, not a people of the rock, a people of faith that's built their life on the rock Jesus, not a church, but the Christ. The one Jesus said, who do people say that I am? And well, some think you're Elijah. One of the prophets, some think you're John the Baptist, raised from the dead. It's good to know what people think, but he said, but who do you say that I am? Because faith will never be developed on someone else's opinion. Can I say that one more time? I'm almost done. Faith will never be developed on someone else's opinion. And Jesus asked them, who do you say that I am? And the one who would be sifted, Jesus had prayed for, he spoke up, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. He said, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, son, but my father taught you that. And I'm telling you on what you just said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Nothing.
can stop a faith that just says, you are who you say you are. You do what you say you do. And I am who you say I am. Father, thank you for your word today. God, it begins with a simple mustard seed faith. You've, all, you've given us all that ability to believe you. I pray for those that are watching at every campus today. Those that are online today. I pray today would be the day where they simply by faith activate the gift. And they say, here, Jesus, here's my life. Not hyped up, manipulated, but because you're drawing me to yourself, I give you my life, my hopes, my dreams, my past, my present, my future. I give you my sin to receive your rightness, your forgiveness. Bless today, I pray, as our pastors take this.